This is Sally. She's an artist with a dream and a brush in hand. After years of selling her paintings at local markets, she finally took the leap and launched her very first online store, sallyshop.test. Passionate about creativity and proud of her work, Sally poured hours into building a beautiful website to showcase and sell her original art. To protect her customers and their data, she even added what she believed was a strong security feature, two-factor authentication. It's secure, she thought. Nobody's getting in unless they know the code. But what Sally doesn't know is that she made one small mistake, one tiny oversight that left the back door wide open. And this is where Kim comes in. He is an ethical hacker, a penetration tester hired to find security flaws before the real criminals do. Today, Kim will gain access to a user's account, bypass their two-factor authentication, and prove the system isn't as bulletproof as Sally thinks. Let's dive in. Two episodes ago, Kim discovered a hidden vulnerability in Sally's website, a SQL injection flaw in the search bar. Using it, he pulled sensitive user data straight from the database, email addresses, and hashed passwords. Then, in the last episode, Kim took it a step further. With John the Ripper and a public word list, he cracked several of those hashes in seconds, including the passwords for users like Joshua and Jane. With those real working credentials, Kim logged into Jane's account. The login was successful, but Kim immediately hit a second wall, two-factor authentication. This raised the crucial question, will two-factor authentication stop Kim in his tracks, or will he find a way around it? Well, let's find out. But first, you might be wondering, what exactly is two-factor authentication? Two-factor authentication is a security method that adds an extra layer of protection to your account. To make your account more secure, it requires not just one, but two independent proofs of identity. The first factor is something you know, such as a password. The second factor is something you have, such as a phone that generates a temporary verification code. This code is usually a six digit that changes every 30 seconds. It's generated by an app like Google Authenticator or sent via SMS or email. Even if someone steals your password, the first factor, they still can't get in without the second factor, the six digit code generated by your Authenticator app. And without that code, they're locked out. It is simple and effective. But as Kim is about to show us, even two-factor authentication isn't bulletproof. To understand what Kim is about to do, we need to take a closer look at the second factor, the six-digit code. So let's ask the real question. What's actually generating those six numbers behind the scenes? Here is how it works. The six-digit code is generated by an algorithm called TOTP, short for time-based one-time passwords. Time-based one-time passwords works by combining two things. First, a shared secret key, known only to the user and the server. And second, the current time. The secret key is created the moment a user sets up two-factor authentication for the first time. On the server side, this key is stored in the database, linked to the user's account. On the user's side, it's saved locally on the device, inside the Authenticator app. Now what about the TOTP algorithm? Where does it come from? Well, that part isn't secret at all. TOTP is a public standard, officially defined in RFC 6238. Every Authenticator app, for example, Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, and so on, follows this exact same algorithm. And so do the servers that support TOTP. So if the server and your Authenticator app both run the same public TOTP algorithm, using the same secret key and the same current time, they'll both generate the exact same six-digit code. And that's how you get authenticated. When you enter your six-digit code during login, the server runs the algorithm on its side and compares the result. If your code matches what the server just calculated, you're in. TOTP is called time-based because the code changes every 30 seconds. It's tied to the clock, not something you manually choose. And it's called one time because each code is valid for just one short window. Once that time passes, it can't be used again. It's a brilliant system, simple, elegant, and widely trusted. But here's the thing, for the system to work, the server needs to store that secret key somewhere. And if Kim can find it, it's game over. So Kim doesn't need Jane's phone. He doesn't need to hack an app. 
All he needs is the TOTP secret key. And where is that key stored? In the database. So Kim just needs one thing, access to the database. And thanks to the SQL injection vulnerability he discovered earlier, he already has that. Last time, Kim used the following SQL injection payload to pull data straight from the user's table. Q equal doctor, single quote, twice the right parenthesis, then union select ID, email, password, 456-789 from users dash dash. With this payload, he extracted the email and password columns, which gave him access to every user's login credentials. But now Kim is after something more, the TOTP secret key the one used to generate the six-digit codes. And now Kim is thinking, if a user has set up two-factor authentication, that TOTP secret key is probably stored right inside the user's table, likely in its own dedicated column. That means Kim doesn't need a new table or a new injection point. All he needs now is the name of the column that holds those TOTP keys. So instead of only pulling the email and password, he adds a fourth column guess trying to find the TOTP secret key. Kim's first guess is simple. Maybe the column is just called TOTP key. So he modifies the payload, adding TOTP key as the fourth column. Note here that the order doesn't matter. He could have added it as the fifth, the sixth, or even the ninth column, as long as the total number matches the expected number of columns in the original query. With the payload ready, he hits enter to URL encode the request then click send. But instead of data, the server fires back with a 500 internal server error. If he scroll down, he can see the cause. No such column TOTP key. This means the column name TOTP key doesn't exist in the user's table. So the entire query failed. But Kim doesn't give up. He knows the secret has to be there somewhere, just under a different name. So he tries again. This time, he guesses TOTP key with an underscore. He updates the payload and sends the request. And again, he get a 500 internal server error. The cause is the same, the column doesn't exist. But Kim is persistent. His next guess is TOTP secret. He updates the payload and sends the request. And boom, the response is a 200 okay. The request was successful. That means the column name exists. Kim probably just found the column name hosting the TOTP key. He scrolls down the list of users. And right there, under Jane's account, a long, strange string of characters. They follow a pattern, uppercase letters and numbers, grouped in a certain way. This is base32 encoding, the format commonly used for TOTP secret keys. As mentioned, the column order in the SQL injection does not matter. To confirm that, Kim repeats the injection with TOTP secret placed as the fifth column instead of the fourth. As you can see, the result is the same. The position doesn't matter. The injection is solid. And now that Kim has Jane's TOTP secret key, he doesn't need her phone. Just this one string is enough. With it, Kim can now generate the exact same six digit codes Jane would see on her phone at the exact same time. The second factor is no longer a barrier. To generate the TOTP six-digit code, Kim opens Google Authenticator right on its own device. He taps the plus button to add a new account. Two options appear, scan a QR code or enter a setup key manually. Kim selects the second option. A setup form appears. As code name, Kim enters Jane. In the key field, he pastes the TOTP secret key he just pulled from the database. For the type of key, Kim keeps it set to time-based, because that's what Sally Shop uses. The other option is counter-based. It's a different kind of one-time password, called HOTP, and it works in a very different way. Instead of changing every 30 seconds like TOTP, HOTP codes are generated using a counter. Every time the user logs in, the counter goes up by one. The server keeps track of the counter too, and if both match, access is granted. HOTP was the original one-time password standard. But TOTP became the most popular because it doesn't require counters to stay in sync. The clock is the source of truth. That's why most modern sites, including Sally Shop, use it. And that's exactly what Kim selects. 
he can then click add. And within seconds, a six digit code appears and a small countdown timer right to it begins ticking. Kim's clone of Jane's 2FA is now fully functional, right on his own phone. He now goes back to Sally shop. He enters Jane's email found in the database two episodes ago and the password he cracked in the last episode, which was I love you. The login is accepted. But then, as expected, Sally Shop prompts for the second factor authentication, a six digit code. But this time, Kim is ready. He looks at his phone, at the freshly synced entry in Google Authenticator, and sees the same kind of code Jane would be seeing on her phone. He types it in, clicks login, and just like that, he's in. He now has a full access, with no password reset, no social engineering, no access to Jane's device, just a secret key in a database and a deep understanding of how systems work. If Kim were a bad actor, things could get much worse. He could browse Jane's order history, change her shipping address, lock her out of her own account, or even make purchases using her stored payment methods. And the terrifying part? To the system, and to Sally, it would all look like Jane was doing it. The login would appear legitimate. The password was correct. The two-factor authentication code matched. There would have been no alarms, no warnings, no suspicion. But luckily, Kim is an ethical hacker and penetration tester. He will report the vulnerabilities to Sally so she can fix them and protect her users. So what went wrong? Sally used hashed passwords. She used two-factor authentication. On paper, that should have been secure. But here's the thing, security is only as strong as your weakest line of defense. In Sally's case, that weak point was storing sensitive secrets in a way that could be accessed by an attacker. Here are a few best practices every developer and admin should follow to secure their users and their data. Use salted and strong password hashing algorithms. Never use plain MD5 or SHA-1. Use modern algorithms like Bcrypt, Scrypt, or Argon2, and always add a unique salt per user. Protect your database against SQL injection. Use parameterized queries or ORM frameworks that handle escaping automatically. Never directly insert user input into SQL statements. Store TOTP secrets securely. Never store them in plain text. At minimum, encrypt TOTP secrets at rest using a strong encryption key. You may also consider storing secrets in a dedicated secure vault like HashiCorp Vault or AWS Secrets Manager. If you found this video helpful or eye-opening, give it a like and subscribe for more deep dives into real-world cybersecurity flaws explained step by step. Thanks for watching and see you in the next episode. Until then, stay curious and stay secure. Bye-bye.